Wow. Hello. Hi. It's the second time you come to Startup, Brian. Uh, we changed a little bit. How do you feel about that? Yeah, you, 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 you're big now. <laughs> <laughs> we're big now. That means yeah. we're not big when we interview you. We interviewed you in, in August 2016. Back then, I remember you were about to launch your first campaign in TV and radio and like go uh, full gas with everything. And you were making like 5 million revenue, which seems very small to, compared to what you're doing now. So what, what have you learned since this last two years, three years? What do you want to share with us? And how was this campaign for you? Yeah, so when, when we last met on stage, exactly. that was August 31st, 2016, yeah. we were about to launch our first marketing campaign on, on mass media. We, we did an ad with a blind painter that said that important things in life, you don't see them with your eyes, such as green energy. You do not see the color of your energy, but it's such an important thing to have or such a, a, as honesty or transparency. And with that campaign, that was our, our presentation, I would say, into the, into the um, industry as a big player. We, our metrics went up very, very fast. At the beginning, the first two weeks, nothing happened. When we were already on TV, nothing happened. <laughs> For the first two weeks, we were there like, totally paralyzed f due to fear. What <laughs> happened? <laughs> because we invested 1 million euros. For us, it was like a, um, a huge amount of money to spend on, on marketing. And for the first two weeks, nothing actually happened. Not even an extra phone call. You know? okay. <laughs> we were there like, what? What have we done? And then after those two weeks... But wait, you didn't fire the director of marketing because it was you, right? It was me, yeah. exactly. <laughs> that was an advantage to have, yeah. <laughs> but then what happened? We, we wait for those two weeks. Uh, we were, as I said, paralyzed for fear. And, and after those two weeks, the message started to get through. And then we started to receive more phone calls and more visitors to our website. And then within the next four weeks, we raised up our sales level. We were there about 70, 80 new customers per day at that time. And we raised it up to 300 new customers per day. That was the rhythm of acquisition that we reached with that campaign. And the, the best of it, the beauty of it, is that it didn't stop when we went out of TV because TV, if you, ever, if you ever do a marketing campaign on TV, you will, you will notice that it, ha it happens so fast. So the, f the six week, eight weeks, nine weeks that you are on, on air, they happen really fast. And then all of a sudden, your million is gone. <laughs> you know? then, and you, you got to wait for the new customers that are going to come thanks to the brand that you have been able to build. It's not like a direct response campaign, the one we did, like a call now and you're going to get 50% off, but a um, campaign based on building up a brand. So after, going, after those nine weeks that we were on, on air, the beauty of our campaign and of, of, of our brand positioning was that two years after, without investing any more, on like a big budget like we did, we still had 300 new customers per day. That's great. Actually, it all seems very beautiful and very easy, but the beginnings of Olaluth were not that easy, and it took you a long time before you got all this recognition and this level of sales. Can you tell us a little bit how you kind of like bootstrap from the very beginning and you power your sales machine? Of course, but, but I got to tell you something, Alex. Yeah, sure. Isn't it easy now? Neither. Uh, all right. No. <laughs> so sure so if, you look for, uh, if you are looking for easy things, you, you better don't become an entrepreneur. So, uh, That's a hard truth. Yeah, yeah, it's a hard truth. It's fun, although it's, it's a lot of fun, and you know, hard things are quite fun normally, but yeah, it's not easy at all. But, yeah, we, we started the company eight years ago. We were, the three of us, sitting together in a bar. We just graduated from our MBA, and we were there thinking, 
while having some beers on what can we do to make this troubled world a little bit better, that sometimes yeah. it's quite troubled, this world. Good stories don't start with the green tea. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah and that, that never happens. Yeah, totally agree. So, yeah, totally. Uh, even though it would be nice, you know, yeah, from, from the storytelling point of view, but exactly. it's always beer involved, yeah. <laughs> And then after the third year, so I, I go, I went to my ISA backpack and take out of that uh, backpack a paper I've spent months in writing, and it says sharing green energy on its first page. And, and what we did, so we started the company right there. So, and my two co-founders, they did the deepest due diligence I've ever seen. <laughs> they, they took my paper, they did like this. They stopped maybe at one or two slides, and then, okay, let's, let's do this. Yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that's what we did. And we focused from the very beginning on, on traction and on getting revenues from customers. And this makes us a very unique company because we are not, um, a, 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 I would say like um, a typical startup that we need to invest a lot of resources or a lot of money at the beginning to develop a product or a technology and then after a while, after the first 12 months or 18 months, then you got to find out how are you going to monetize that model that you've invested in, in our case. So we have a business model very easy. So we sell green energy with positive mar margins to customers that pay us. No, it's yeah, a very it's typical a business model. <laughs> so then we were able to monetize that from the very beginning. We got recurrent revenues from the very beginning, and that makes us, that made us very independent and from from getting in investment from from VCs. Did you get like who were your first clients? How did you get them? Did you actually threaten them? Yeah, sure, yes. totally, right. absolutely. Anyway, so, yeah. <laughs> the, the first clients, the first three clients, I guess you may imagine who we were, yeah. <laughs> the three co-founders. Then <laughs> the, at, the, at the end of 2011, that's when we started the company, we were fighting for breaking the, um, the 100 customers barrier. Those 100 customers were all family, friends, and fools. And of course, we um, we practically forced them to, to switch to La Luz, of course. Yeah. Of course, so yeah. I remember once we were, um, we were watching the, um, the championship final in our home, and, and I prevent all my friends, okay, you can come in. I will cook Spanish omelette for all of you, but you got to bring in your energy bill because I'm going to switch you to our company. And one, so one guy, he, he forgot, you know, but, but I really prevent them. So he went back home? Of course he did. And, That's how you do it. And he, he just arrived on time when the championship him was uh, already on. That's a really good friend. <laughs> I'm actually trying to tell you, so, you know, startups uh, come, uh, come to us uh, very often. They say, like, hey, I'm trying to raise funds. I've got this idea, this and that. That's, uh, I don't know, if, we're, we're not in, in like 1999. You can raise money with a PowerPoint. It's very hard, right? You were concentrated on sales since day one, right? Mm -hmm. What other tricks did you do besides your initial investment? I, I know you got some loans and credit from the bank. Can you share a little bit like that and how you built your team to, to focus on sales? Yeah, so yeah, you got to so focus on sales. It's for us the best strategy we could, we could ever follow because it makes us totally independent from any other resources. So, yeah. meaning sales with positive margin, of course. So, we, we, yeah. we generate sales, we generate positive gross margin, and then we can structure the cost of the company, the operational cost of the company, mm, that are coherent with the gross margin that we are generating. Mm -hmm. Then, from time to time, we can invest more, because we are tractioning more, we are preparing for the next step, and then we might be out of, of positive margin for a while, and, and then we need to finance this, this, working, this working capital for growth, mm -hmm. and we've been able to leverage uh, our company very, very nicely from, from bank products, from financial products that are already on the market, and also, of course, after five years, we raised money from, from a VC to speed up our growth. So it's like a growth money. And now, after those eight years, we are today at a revenue rate, rate of 18 million per month. We are generating out of that 1.6 million euros of gross margin every month. And we have, of course, um, short-term debt to finance the working capital. 
and we are raising a, a big, a big round of, of yeah, of, of capital. Can you share? Can you share? <laughs> How much are you raising? We, we, raising? we can crowdfund yeah. this. Yes, we got yeah. a lot of people. Yeah, you, you can crowdfund that maybe. <laughs> <laughs> now we are raising 60 million, six zero, which is a, a huge amount of money, and we are working very hard to close that as soon as possible because we, we right now we we um, we have a huge opportunity in front of us. Um, Spanish green electricity market market j just had exploded since the last six months, and we have now the perfect pl platform, the brand, the capabilities, uh, both in technical systems and team for capturing this opportunity, and that's why we feel that is the moment. Uh, you say that revenue cures everything, right? Which I think is a very great sentence. And, and It's I not mine, though. Eh? It's not mine, <laughs> but you say it, you say it, so you can say that. Um, uh, one of the things that I remember when I interviewed you uh, the last time, you shared something like, Every employee of Oladuz spends like a couple hours, I don't know, a month or something like that doing customer service. That's, is this still we, going we still on? Do, we still Are do you that. still doing it, of Carlotta? Course. That's my question. Yeah, yeah, of course. That's, that's, part, that's a crucial part of our culture. Because Great. exactly, if we, if we focus on sales and we focus on delivering a, an experience, a customer experience that we've promised within our brand, it's crucial that we ensure that this delivery that, that we really keep our promises within our customers. It's, it's, it's absolutely crucial. And then, if you want to create a company culture where everyone is focused on sales, they have to be focused on the customer as well. Because for us, sales mean treating the customers the best we can. And the best way to do that, because we can, you can pitch everyone every week with the, the best pitch ever, and yeah, you will get some messages through. Mm -hmm. But an African proverb says that, that words explain things, but example, it's what kills. Right. So then if you sit down there in our customer service area for two hours a month, even though if you are a developer, even though if you are the CFO, or if you are the CMO, or if you are, I don't know, if you are working as a, as a product owner, because we, we use agile methodologies, then you connect really with what our customers need and you get real feedback, you get real problems, and, and you really know what it's all about. And yeah, you know, and sometimes, I, 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 I gotta tell the truth, so sometimes in, in some seasons of our lives, while we get very busy, sometimes we are, we are threatened of just get rid of the hola cliente, we call it hola cliente. Yeah. And yeah, maybe you skip one, or, and all the time that we've been skipping the hola cliente for one or two months, things are going wrong. So we need to go back to our basics and, and take care of our real customers. You're, you're really good at sales. I remember when I interviewed you, we, were like, we had like 90 people in the audience. It was August, so it was really good uh, for August. And I'm pretty sure that by the very end of the event, at least 90% of the audience actually checked your website. Probably some people, you know, checked even more details like pricing and all of that. And I'm sure a few of them converted. My question is, how, did, how are you able to replicate yourself and how did you build your sales team and structure? So we, we, again, it's about culture. So when, when we grow up as a startup, you realize that it's all about two things. It's about having the A team, and you gotta make sure that the people you're working with are, are better than you, and are the best, the, the best they can in their positions, that, that's crucial. And second thing, you gotta make sure that you generate the company culture where those A team can develop at their fullest. And this is something that it doesn't happen just by incidence, you got to put a lot of energy, a lot of intention in generating this A team and in generating this culture. And how do you do that? By the, the methodology of repetition. You got to repeat, repeat those concepts. The offices of Ola Luz, you, you are all of you invited, of course, so you've seen them. They're Each great, and yeah. every corner of our office is its um, replication of our culture. So it's like going beyond the culture and convert it into a cult, where you can, uh, when you, where you can recall. You're the leader of the cult. <laughs> that's what you're saying. <laughs> the three of us, the three of oh, founders. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe I'm, good. I'm the one in charge to, to put yeah. it into life. But yeah, the three of us, we share totally the, this vision of the world.
um, let's build up on the thing that we were mentioning. You know, sales is the is actually the foundation of your growth, and actually, sales has enabled you to raise funds or even like get better conditions when negotiating with investors. Can you share a little bit like that uh, about that? Of yeah. course. So if you if you manage to get a company that 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 tractions and that has recurrent revenues and those recurrent revenues lead to positive gross margin and then out of that you have an OPEX that it's less than this gross, gross margin or at least comparable it might be a slightly bigger and then you you end up with like a negative EBDA but not so much then you can go to commercial banking and then you can leverage your your equity with commercial banking that that and you have to pay a lot less interest than selling out your your equity of the company and then it can help you through this path of, of growth and and it's something that sometimes we as startups we forget that we have also access to other financing tools such as commercial banking such as venture debt for example it's also another tool that you can you can check out so it's not only about money from VCs or money from private equities or money from angels. So it, it's not only about uh, equity, but also about other instruments to, to finance your company. And this is something important because most of us, we are engineers, we focus in, on products, we focus on marketing, we focus on culture, we focus on, on getting the right business model. But remember that sometimes it, it might be interesting to bring in somebody with knowledge in corporate finance. And, and those guys can help you to structure, which is the best financing structure for the type of business that you have. And how about going to the market where there have been these incumbents for so many, many years that generate so much money, and they can actually, or they could, we would think, they could crush you, right? But you're fighting against them. You start as a bootstrap company, you're growing all the way up. So how do you devise this strategy, and is it actually working? Do you see uh, that people are actually switching to your side because they, they're like, I'm fed up with the old school companies. I want to be part of Ola Luz. Yeah, so let, let's, let's, because you, you're making a lot of questions in the I same know. questions. Yeah, because we're running short on time. We've got to wrap, wrap this up. So but it's fine. the last one. So then, then let me ask first the last question and Great. at the beginning the first sure. one. So of course, each, of, each and all of us, we, we already have electricity at home. We use electricity. It's, it's something that is crucial for life. Then, with the 700 to 1200 that you are spending already in electricity every year, you have the power to choose which vision of the world you want to support. That's, that's very easy to do. So if you, if you really want to think about doing something to make this travel world a little bit better, you just have to switch to Ola Luz, for example. No? That's a great this sales is, speech, yeah? This is one thing. <laughs> That's one yeah? answer, This yeah. is one thing <laughs> that anyone can do. Anyone can do. And then, second thing, our relationship with the incumbents. So, our relationship with the incumbents have, have followed uh, a book manual of uh, incumbent behavior. <laughs> yeah. The first, I would say, three to five years, they just ignored us. The following two years, they tried to fight us back, and now they copy us. Yeah, I remember you said something in the interview, like, oh, you know, we launched this, like a small change on your landing page, or something. I think it was a, a calculator, price calculator, I said like, oh, and this, our river draw, whatever, copied that the next day. So is that the moment when you see like, oh, things are going well, I actually nail yeah. it? Yeah. That's where, that's where we realized that we actually were, were leading an energy transformation because it's not about how many customers do we have, that we have already 200,000, which is a pretty huge yeah. amount of customers, but it's not about the number of customers because our competitors, they have 10 million customers there, so they have mm, by far much more customers than we have. <clears throat> but the thing is that when you set up the rules when you set up the directions of what it's going to, to, to be next on the industry you are in, that's where you start feeling that you, you might be leading, no? And, yeah. and examples of that, so sometimes we, we made up prices in our website. We made them up, totally. So it's impossible to get to that number 
through a calculation. It's impossible because we made them up. All right. And the very next day, we get copied. <laughs> so. La last question to wrap this up. Um, I remember when I interviewed you last time, you were commenting on, I never had that much amount to play with, like money with uh, marketing campaigns and all of that. Now it seems you have it. We have, I'm going to yeah. ask you, what's the most expensive fuck up you've done in your company? Uh, we've, we've done like thousands. But yeah. Mm. So the thing is that we, although we have already money to invest in, because now we are fractioning at 500, almost already 600 new customers per day mm -hmm. today. So um, meaning that our marketing machine, it's getting bigger and bigger. And that's why so nowadays we invest 1 million each quarter. And we think that it's like the, the, the always on investment. No? <laughs> While three years ago, 1 million was like all we had. No? But even though we are investing already huge marketing uh, budgets, we still have, um, uh, because it's, it's in our DNA, this approach of capital efficiency. So, so yeah. and we really, we really discuss budgets of a Twitter campaign for uh, 17,000, or we, we do discuss this kind of budget. But what was the most, like, in which one did you fuck up, actually? That's, can you share No, one? because, you know... We, you don't fuck so up. You always we, learn, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I don't remember an investment that we did, like, okay, uh, okay, okay, I remember one. So, we invested, like, 280,000? Yes. In a, in a radio campaign. Yes. And it, it didn't work out. But it, it wasn't because of the radio. It wasn't because of the media itself. It was, it was because of the concept that we launched on that campaign. So it, it, because we used the radio just as a, an, a standalone media for that campaign. And then we realized that it was very good to amplify an investment on, online or or both in online, in TV online, or in, in offline TV. But we did it like a standalone investment, and it didn't go, it didn't go through. That's a pretty expensive one. Thank you for yeah. sharing, Carlota. <laughs> it's been a pleasure to interview you again. Thank you very much, and congratulations on what you've done. Big applause, gentlemen and ladies, Thank for Carlota. All right.